Hi, I'm Dennis Thompson. I'm uh, retired. I'm the Alfred North Whitehead Professor of Political Philosophy Emeritus at Harvard, where I started the Harvard's first uh, interfaculty uh, program. It was originally called the Program in Ethics in the Professions and is now the Edmund J. Safra Center for ethics, uh, and it's doing quite well in my absence. Uh, and it became a model for uh, a number of other centers across the uh, uh, country uh, include where people came as fellows and then they went back and started their own center. That, uh, Amy Gutman came as a fellow and came, went back and started a, um, an even bigger center at Princeton, Elizabeth Keish at Duke, Melissa Williams at Toronto. And so it has been uh, quite influential um, in a good way in this. And it was partly because of that center uh, that I was uh, invited to give the keynote uh, address at uh, an inter a conference or a workshop, really, what it was that David Smith organized in Indiana in 1988. Uh, and uh, we didn't, we were surprised in a way how much interest there was, and in, in, not in my keynote so much uh, uh, by any means, but the bringing together people who, who were teaching in different ethics in different professions uh, found that they had common problems and they were very excited to get together because except for bioethics and a few other areas, uh, the teaching of ethic, ethics of the professions was, was an isolated activity. People felt sort of, no, they didn't have many colleagues and they didn't have people to talk to ab about the problems that they were facing in, the, in, in teaching. Uh, it, the, field was ethics teaching was dominated in the academy by philosophers and theologians who really weren't that interested in practical problems. They used hypothetical examples more than real examples. And practitioners who would come to the university or the centers were thought ethics was important, but they were much more an ad hoc, unsystematic uh, uh, approach. So we were trying uh, early on, the people who were teaching ethics and that we were interested in, were trying to bridge the gap or stake out a middle ground that was intellectually rigorous, but practically uh, relevant. And, and in that spirit, uh, the discussion generated a lot of enthusiasm in that uh, initial meeting. Um, so much so that um, we thought it would be a good idea to hold the National Invitational Conference. Um, in the official history, I'm credited with the idea of making the first steps toward uh, that, uh, toward the association. but. As I remember it, it, it was more something that grew out of a kind of general enthusiasm in, for a need really for cross professional talk uh, that led to the uh, conference that did uh, occur the following year. And uh, at that conference, it was explicitly uh, proposed that we should have an organization uh, and a, a couple of more meetings, including uh, a critical meeting at Harvard in 1990, where uh, the charter was written and uh, Brian Schrag was uh, recruited to be the um, executive director. I think he was called executive secretary at the time, but he was obviously um, much more than a secretary. He was uh, the, a moving force with, uh, with the organization in the early years. We couldn't have done anything without him. And the, uh, 
the founding, uh, a board was appointed and the organization officially started in 1991. I think that's the date that it was up and running. The founding members, um, you, you asked uh, about them and I think it's worth noting, uh, they're all distinguished activity, uh, distinguished colleagues. Um, and I've written them down, so I won't forget anybody. Um, Thank you. The uh, Cicela Bach, who was at Harvard at the time, uh, was a major influence on a lot of us. Uh, her book on lying was an example of, of how one could combine serious, rigorous thinking with the relevant practical work. Dan Callahan, who was, had founded the Hastings Center, uh, was a leading figure in bioethics. Denny Elliott, then at Montana, later at South Florida, was uh, a major person in media ethics. Robert Fullenwinder at Maryland at the Institute of Public Policy there was a, a, a leading light in uh, public policy ethics. Amy Gutman, uh, who was, had founded the uh, Ethics Center at Princeton. Steve uh, Kalish at Nebraska, who, and I don't know if there was a center there, but he was very active in legal ethics. How do you spell his name? Uh, K-A-L-I-S-H. Oh yes, I got it, sorry, I've forgotten him. All right, good. Uh, Mike Pritchard at Western Michigan where there was a Center for Ethics, which he helped establish. David Smith, whom I've already mentioned at the Pointer Center in uh, Indiana. Uh, Nick Stenick at Michigan, who was a major person in research ethics. Uh, myself uh, at Harvard and Vivian Weil at um, Illinois Tech, who was a pioneer in engineering ethics. So it's uh, quite geographically diverse. Um, I wouldn't say ethnically or racially diverse, which has always been one of the uh, challenges of the association is to try to improve on that. But intellectually quite respectable and uh, many of whom uh, were already directing or founding centers uh, for ethics with the common agreement of trying to find this middle ground between philosophy and theology on the one hand and practical ad hoc uh, ethical reasoning on the other. Initially, um, our general aim was, as I've already suggested, to try to and develop a particular kind of ethics, the uh, practical rather than theoretical and rigorous rather than ad hoc. So uh, that was the general aim, uh, but we, the, the means that we expected to uh, carry out this aim were initially targeted on ethics centers and major uh, universities. The, um, we didn't initially have many practitioners, as you can see from the board, they're, they're all academics or people involved in quasi-academic institutes. And um, that was uh, deliberate, although we didn't think it would should remain that way. Um, uh, yeah, and in fact, it changed over the years. The, um, we didn't initially target students either. Uh, so it was the teachers and researchers in universities who were the um, primary audience and the primary um, source of our membership. And that changed uh, for the better, I think, uh, over the years.
one of your questions was, uh, did the uh, expectations and goals change over time? And they did. Um, the, um, for one thing, more practitioners joined. So we have ethics corporate uh, compliance board members or government ethics officers and people like that um, joined and developed programs. We had programs for not only uh, for, the, for teachers, but also for students. It became a very important activity. And this is something we hoped at the beginning, but never imagined that it would grow as, as well as it has. Uh, the Ethics Bowl, which involved undergraduates and has become a national, even an international success. Um, we, I can't say that we envisaged that at the beginning. We hoped that students would get involved, but we didn't actually think out how that might happen. Uh, and, but yet it did. Uh, summer workshops, uh, the um, programs on research ethics, uh, a book publication series for Oxford, uh, sponsored by the association. And of course, uh, the annual meeting with its little mini conferences for more specialized. Um, that was one of the things we that I, I thought was particularly successful. The annual meeting addressed general issues of common interest across the teaching of professions. Uh, where, and then to satisfy the need for going into greater depth on particular issues, topics like environmental ethics, we'd hold many conferences which would be held um, concurrently with the annual meeting, sort of uh, tacked on to the end usually, and that those developed a considerable amount of interest. You, uh, you ask what has the APPE accomplished? Um, and I've already mentioned the, you know, I, I, I made a list uh, just to remind myself and it's really quite amazing. Uh, I think we never, we hoped uh, that when we started the association, that it would broaden its membership and broaden its activities and involve more people at different levels. And, but uh, to tell you the truth, we, or at least I, didn't expect uh, it to be as successful as it was. We've got the annual meeting with the keynote speakers of great, starting with Michael Walzer and having many. If you look at the list of keynote speakers, it's the leading lights in the, uh, in the whole uh, world of practical ethics. The mini conferences I've already mentioned, the book room, which um, Denny Elliott would chide me if I forgot to mention that. It was a great, started out as just a, a little um, collection of, of uh, books that members donated and then he put together and it was combined with the annual meeting, and so, it, but it became a very important sort of um, rallying uh, a place to for people to meet and talk and find out what the latest work in the field was uh, looks like. The research ethics programs, of which became major, in fact, actually raised some money for the uh, for the association. Uh, Stuart Gilman started some workshops for government ethics. He was head of the Office of Government Ethics or, or the executive director. Uh, I mentioned the book series in which um, one of the books uh, was uh, devoted entire to uh, cr criticism and commentary on a book that Amy Gutman and I had written. So it was a book about a book. Um, it's a record that make, I think we'd have to say, makes the founding fathers and founding mothers uh, proud. Uh, and, and much of it happened, uh, or at least some of it happened after we uh, stepped down from our positions on the board. So I wouldn't credit, credit the original board with laying the foundations and 
setting out the overall vision, but the, the growth and success of the organization has depended on many other people and many of our successors. So um, it really, um, uh, it, it's really a collective accomplishment of great significance and um, continuing influence that I, for one, am very proud to have been involved in the early years. And how do you, what kinds of uh, issues do you think they should be talking about today? Have you anything you think that is really important that they may or may not have touched on? Well, I, you know, I, I think to the credit of the association, um, they've anticipated problems and uh, covered a wide range. I think uh, two problems seen, which were discussed before or treated before, but have become more um, relevant today. Racial injustice, I think, is uh, high on, should be and is high on the agenda of any ethics um, organization. And then the, the polarization in society, particularly in American society, makes having ethical conversations across um, ethical differences much harder. And that it was sort of ethics in the face of disagreement was always something that we um, worried about. But I think it's become more important than, um, than in the past. But I wouldn't want to lose sight of in trying to be, you know, one of the um, strengths of the association has been, in fact, to um, respond to flexibly to go, uh, issues as they come up. And uh, it didn't, we didn't really want to um, uh, have, say, in the charter, a set of issues that the association had to take up. And so it's been uh, responsive to the ethical challenges that arise in um, everyday life. Still, uh, I would emphasize that um, another strength is that we have continued, the association has continued to look at um, common problems, the, say justice and healthcare. Uh, from the beginning was an issue and, and, and it, it changes its shape now. Um, and each decade uh, we can look at it anew with a fresh perspective. So that's one of the, one of the strengths of the association is not, not so much that it's not only that it takes up new and relevant issues that were not uh, discussed before, but also re takes a fresh look at the old and continuing issues uh, that um, are still uh, relevant. Yes. Um, one, just one thing you, you began mentioning when I mean, it was founded with, with centers in mind. One of the things that strikes me, and maybe you got comment at the, that's unlike any other conference I go to, and that is they always have a session or a day where ethics centers talk to each other and, and uh, new, new people who are starting new centers come and, and learn a lot. And I think that is a, a unique, I don't know if your experience have, has found that, but I think that's very unique uh, in this association and uh, that I haven't seen in other associations, even though you know there, there's about what, 200 business ethics centers. Well, I never see that at the business ethics meetings. I never see anything about centers, which is too bad, but, but I think that's one of APPY's real, con uh, one of the main, one of its many contributions. I wonder if you'd speak to that. Yeah, I think that's right. In fact, um, implicit in what I was saying about the original meetings, uh, I think one of, one of the things that got generated so much interest was that we had these people who were either directors and founders of ethics centers, but also some people who wanted to start ethics centers and needed guidance. Um, and so 
definitely it was one of the uh, uh, originating impulses for uh, the association. But we didn't initially um, have uh, breakout sessions for directors that developed a few years later and has become, um, I think, as you, you, I think you're right, it's unique. At least I'm not aware of any other professional association that does that and uh, has won a lot of acclaim uh, and has helped a lot of fledgling centers uh, get um, uh, advice and, and uh, a sense of that they're not alone. Uh, I, I, the question that we got most often in those workshops or for the directors was, um, how do we persuade the president or the provost to fund us better than, right. you know? <laughs> and uh, the, the answer to that is, um, remains a, a, a mystery, I think. Yes, and we don't have, a, we don't, there's no simple answer to that. We've all had that problem. Yeah. But, but it's, a, it's, a, it's a good question anyway, good. Um, anything else you want to comment on? Uh, on the, on, well, anything you'd like, but particularly on Appy. Well, uh, I, I, I would say the, um, it, it, I would repeat a little bit what I did before, which is it's, it, it's exceeded our expectations. We had high expectations um, as founders, um, but I don't, I. I think if you ask each of us, we would be um, surprised and pleased about how broad the range of activities and the, the membership has grown uh, over the years. Uh, and I'm particularly pleased to see that the students have become involved in the ethics bowl, particularly, but more generally in the association. And that was something that we hoped at the beginning, uh, but didn't actually make explicit provision for. So that, um, that's one of the uh, elements of the uh, progress of the association that I think I've, I've been most pleased to see uh, that we didn't have initially. Um, I would say uh, it's um, of all the, the associations that I've been involved with, the the appy is as you say uh, pat unique but um uh it's also in some ways the most stimulating because of the diversity intellectual diversity of the uh members and the um, quality of the discussions and excitement, the intellectual excitement that's generated at the meetings and all the other activities. Yeah, I always learn something new there, but I don't know what it's going to be. Yeah, well, that's true. And that's all right, that's good. Yeah, and uh, I, I think, yeah, as I said, one of the great strengths of the association is to be uh, responsive and not rigid about what issues are taken up. And so, you know, who would have imagined even 10 years or five years ago that the question of what are the pr principles for distributing a vaccine uh, ethically uh, would be, we, you know, we had talked about distributing scarce resources. That was a perennial problem, um, medical resources uh, in, in all discussions, but specifically on something like vaccine, nobody thought that that would be no. Nobody thought of that as an important issue, it's, but yet it obviously is now, and the association is, um, I assume, beginning to take some association members I know have already written on this uh, issue. It will probably be one of the topics in the next co conference, which will be online. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, the um, one of the early keynote speakers of the association and a, and a member of the association was Zeke Emanuel, 
who um, is now on President elect Biden's task force um, and is also something of a controversial figure too, because he wrote a paper saying that he would want to die at age 75. But he didn't, of course. I think he must be approaching 75. He's not about to die. The, um, the other thing, he was on the task force for, the Ob for Obamacare too. And if you look at what he's written, if you look at the act, well, if you could get through the act, you have to be have insomnia, but uh, he was very influential in the in the way the uh, Obamacare was constructed. Yeah, he, he, he definitely was. Shortly after that um, article was published, he had my wife and me um, to dinner for sort of a birthday celebration um, for him and with his family, just a small group. And uh, I said, Zeke, do you realize, you know, you've written this article and, and our birthday is coming up uh, and we're going to be 75. <laughs> and he said, oh, that doesn't apply to you guys. I <laughs> see. You're exempt. You got an exemption card. <laughs> General, general principles have to have exemptions. I they all have to have provisos, but but it was a, not a very good thing to say. He should. It was. It was much. He shouldn't have said that. That's right. But he probably wanted us all to retire when seventy five. Well, we did. Another <laughs> uh, anecdote, which I, I think I told this, but um, the uh, the the growth of the association coincided with and to a large extent contributed to the growth of the professional ethics more generally. I mean, it was, it was amazing starting with uh, bioethics and business ethics and then political ethics and, and many other professions started realizing the need for ethics. And so you had veterinarian ethics and uh, engineering ethics and city planning <coughs> ethics, and um, it went so far. Ethics. Education ethics. Uh, I got in the mail, uh, I was going to bring it today, but I uh, don't have it. I still have it in my library. I, you know, as, as teachers of ethics, we, as you must know this, we get a lot of textbooks in the mail. And I got one one day and I opened it up and said, undertaking ethics. Uh, and for, I first thought, you, you see what it was, but I first thought it was undertake as to take on, you know, to take up and um, no. ethics. But it, no, it was the National Funeral Association's uh, little handbook on uh, ethics for undertakers. Uh, and it, it didn't have the philosophical rigor, rigor that we might have hoped for, but it did suggest that you have, we now have ethics from cradle to grave. <laughs> and beyond. <laughs> and beyond. The uh, great poli uh, Louisiana politician uh, was um, asked by a young student for advice. The student had been uh, assigned a topic in a debate, does, does, uh, does ethics have any use in politics? And um, the, he went to this uh, politician who was uh, well known for a little bit of corruption, but was very effective. And, and the politician said, oh, that's great. And the student said, no, it's not great. I, I have to, uh, I, I've been assigned the affirmative. I have to say ethics does have a use in politics. And the politician said, this is a true story apparently. The politician said, no, that's great. That's even better because ethics in politics, you have to use every damn thing you can get your hands on. <laughs> And the student went away quite happy. I don't think he won the debate, though. 